All right, elders, deacons, preachers, saints, this is lesson number four. And uh, this, uh, the title of this lesson is Elders, Specific Qualifications. Specific Qualifications. Now, uh, we're reviewing the different roles in the church that carry a specific responsibility. That's what we've been talking about in this course, in this class. And we started by focusing in on the role of the elders and said that they exercise the leadership of Christ in the local assembly. Now I've looked at some uh, general characteristics concerning elders that are found throughout the New Testament before we come to this lesson where we're concentrating on more specific qualifications found in 1 Timothy and, and Titus. So uh, briefly, oh, here we go, all right. So briefly, what we've said so far, and this is just a, for review purposes, we've said that elders, uh, first of all, accept only the Bible as God's word. We're looking for those kind of men who understand that idea. They, they love the church. Uh, they know how to worship publicly as well as privately. Uh, elders work well with others, very important, because uh, it's called an eldership. It means the leadership uh, leading with a group of, of men, so uh, you want men who are able to work with others. Uh, they understand decision making, uh, they're dependable. Elders also are able to share their feelings with the congregation, a sense of empathy for what is taking place. So these were some of the general things that we mentioned about the kind of men who should be encouraged to serve uh, as elders. So today I want to look at some of the more specific qualifications required for the, uh, for the eldership. Um, when, when we're discussing the specifics of the eldership, it's helpful to understand what is cultural and what is eternal in the Bible, because there's, there's been a lot of confusion about that. So I want to start by talking about the difference between what's cultural and what's eternal. There are some things in the Bible uh, that are describes, uh, described, rather, that were there simply because of culture. In other words, it was part of the culture when the Bible was written. For example, the way that they dressed in those times, not the way that we dress today. That's a cultural thing. The way they talked, for example, or certain, certain customs like uh, the washing of feet or the wearing of veils, these things were part of the custom of that culture. The washing of feet uh, was a mark of hospitality. They wore sandals in those days, and, and if you were uh, you know, invited to someone's home, you went to someone's home, there was water that was left out and a, a towel, so on and so forth, that you might wash your feet. Uh, if the household was large enough, it, if it had slaves or whatever, one of the slaves were, was there to assist you with that. It was a mark of hospitality, part of that culture. The women wore veils, again, part of that culture. So the thing we need to understand is that the Bible comments on these type of cultural things and we see people experiencing these things, but they were part of their cultural setting and a part of their experience and not commandments that needed to be perpetuated beyond their cultural context. Foot washing, for example, uh, uh, even Jesus uses that common uh, experience, that common custom of the time to teach His apostles a very important lesson about humility and service demonstrating that he could serve them and so therefore they could serve one another. So, so long as this custom was significant culturally, it should be done as a sign of mutual service. Of course today it is no longer relevant in our society. We could now uh, you know, mow each other's lawn or render other service to achieve the same object. You know, somebody comes to your house today, well, you take their coat, you offer them a beverage. I know in Canada, where uh, you know, the winters are long and people are wearing overshoes, you know, boots and things like that, and the, there's lots of slush, and you know, it's just very dirty. Uh, in the wintertime, when you, when you come into someone's house, obviously you wipe your feet, but most people, the custom is, you remove your boots, and the host usually has several pairs of slippers that they offer you. Some people have paper slippers, 
uh, uh, disposable paper slippers that they offer their guests so that they can wear those, or some people even have real slippers, and, uh, and that's the custom, the custom in that particular, uh, in that particular uh, 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 culture. Now, other things are eternal, not just cultural. They may have been part of the Jewish culture or they may have begun during that time, but through teaching and command and example have become perpetual things in the Christian faith. For example, let me get another slide up there. Baptism. Now baptism was something used by both uh, Jews, even pagans, in some pagan religions they had water rituals in those days. But we know from the Gospels that Jesus took this ritual, this, this burial in water, if you wish, and He made it a necessary part of the Christian faith. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, you know, how, were, how were we to make disciples? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, what were people to do in response to Peter's sermon? They were to rem repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. The word baptism in the Greek meaning to be immersed. So Jesus takes something that's part of the culture of many different cultures, but He appropriates it and makes it part of the Christian faith, a perpetual thing. Um, in the same way, the role of men and women in the church, in the family. You know, a lot of people argue that this was a cultural thing, and in modern times, the biblical models of wives you know, being in submission to their husbands, uh, or that uh, there should be male spiritual leadership in the church, a lot of people argue, well, that's out of date, that was just the culture of the first century, things are different now, so on and so forth. But the Bible teaches that this uh, uh, it's teaching about the role of men and women. This is an eternal model that is begun in the book of Genesis, all the way back in Genesis, and then reinforced throughout the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 11, 2, Ephesians 5, 22. There are several places in the New Testament as far as the relationship between the husband and wife in the family setting, where the apostles, the inspired apostles, are saying that uh, wives should be in submission to her husbands. Now there are other instructions for the husbands how they're supposed to treat their wives as well. But these instructions, these are not culturally based. These are perpetual things. These are eternal things. Therefore, some things were cultural and the Bible mentions them. And then other things the Bible talks about um, um, and makes them permanent through their teaching through the example of the apostles, and so on and so forth. Now you may be wondering, why, why am I talking about this? Well, the reason I'm saying all of this is because the argument to have women be preachers or pastors today is based on the idea that having only men as the leaders in the church was a cultural thing in Jewish society and that in modern times, this should be abolished. That's the argument. If you ever wondered, how come that church across the street, they say Pastor Josephine Smith, why is, why is she able to be a pastor? Or uh, some, uh, you know, someone else, evangelist uh, you know, Mary Brown is coming. You know? how, how come they have an evangelist named Mary Brown but here in the church, it's only in the Church of Christ, in our congregation, only the men are in roles of leadership. Why is that? Why, why is the difference? And I'm telling you, the difference is that wherever uh, groups, denominations have allowed women to be in roles of leadership, the, the, the decision was based on the idea that what the Bible is teaching concerning the role of women and men is only cultural. And after the first century, you know, once culture changed, we have to change with it. That's the argument that they make. The answer to this, of course, is that in the New Testament, every command, every teaching, and every example, and every reference to the leadership of the church always refers to men, always. 
I've heard some people say, oh, you know, they, you know men made that up. You, know, you, you men in the church, you're the ones that perpetuate this thing. You know? No. Just a, just a careful reading of the New Testament. Start, you know, start in Matthew, go all the way to Revelation and note every time there's a mention of leadership in the church, you'll note that a woman is never referred to uh, as, a, as a leader. I mean, the word elder means older man. Uh, the person needs to be a husband and father when we get to the specific qualifications. All references where elders are the subject in the New Testament always describe men. Now the point here is that if this was only a cultural thing, the Bible would have left the door open for change, but it doesn't. It doesn't. It is unanimous from beginning to end. And I don't say this you know, gloating. Oh, we win. It's not a winning type of thing. <laughs> you know, men have to obey the word of God and do things the way the word teaches us to do it. And you know, there was a time when that was kind of easy, but that's not easy in this society. If you say, that, if you say what I'm just saying in this society, not to a church audience, but to a secular audience, well, you'll just get laughed right off the stage. Are you kidding me? So we have to maintain what the scripture teaches irregardless of what society thinks from generation to generation. Now the point here is that if this was only a cultural thing, as I say, the Bible would have you know, given some sort of instruction, but it, but it doesn't. For example, it was Jewish custom for women not to have freedom to choose whom they wish to marry. And the New Testament comments on that. But by not commenting or making a command of this, it allowed this custom to die on its own and permitted women the freedom without religious interference. You know, Paul even comments on this custom in 1 Corinthians 7, but he doesn't command that the custom be perpetuated. See what I'm saying? All right, now the fact that there are clear and specific instructions for men to form the leadership in the church, we have to conclude that this was one area that was eternal and not cultural. Remember, the basic rule is we do speak and teach and insist where the Bible does, and we are silent when it doesn't. So when it comes to elders, for example, the Bible does speak and it does give commands and it does give instructions and, 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 and it does give examples as to who these people were and how they were selected and what were their qualifications without reference to women in these roles at any time. So we have to just take it as it is. I mean, if we want to be the New Testament church, if that's our goal, if we, want to, if we want to please people in the world, well, okay, we'll please them. But if we want to be the New Testament church, the church that is described in the New Testament, then we have to follow the model that is in the New Testament. And that model uh, given is male spiritual leadership. Okay, so I just wanted to say something about that. Now let's talk about the specific qualifications. Two places in the New Testament where Paul specifically talks about elders and their qualifications. First one is in 1 Timothy chapter 3, so if you want to follow along in your Bibles, you can open there. In this particular passage, Paul is giving instruction to Timothy, a young evangelist, about the church in general and how people should conduct themselves as part of that church. And then in chapter 3, he lists some specific qualifications of those who would be church leaders. He says in chapter 3, verse 1, it is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work uh, he desires to do. And so you know, you're wondering, what's the first qualification? Well, the first qualification is the desire to serve. The desire to serve as an elder is a good thing, and it's not to be interpreted negatively by others it's not necessarily a sign of pride. I've heard people say, well, we can't choose that guy. He actually wants to be an elder. That must mean he's proud. Well, no. And the very first qualification 
is that a man who will serve in this role needs the desire to do this work. So that's, that's a good thing. He also states that this is a man's role and that it is a specific task. It's a specific, quote, office. Now the original Greek here does not have a word for office, the office of El there's no word for that. Another way of saying this would be, if any man desire the overseership, or if any man desire, desires the eldership or the pastorate. Okay? Paul says this is a good work, and the key word is work. This is not an honor that is bestowed on a person. It's a task, it's an honorable task, a job, a ministry, it's a good one, but at its base, it's a work, it's a service. The man aspires, that word aspires, reaches for it because he desires or wants it. He is not drafted into it, he's not sold on it, he's not pushed into it. You ought to be an elder, come on, come on, come on, you know, you know. Free lunch. No, if you have to talk somebody into being an elder, that person isn't ready. If you have to talk him into it, obviously he doesn't desire it. It's good that there is a, a moment of humble reflection that a man you know, kind of stops and says, well, you know, I don't know, you know, I hope I'm, I'm worthy to do this, that's good, that's a good thing. But if you have to harangue and talk and twist their arm for weeks at a time you know, to get them to do it, they're, they're not ready, they're not ready to do it. And so we go on to uh, verse two and three, let's, read the, let's just read the list, okay? Let the word speak for itself. It says, an overseer then must, have, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fail into, uh, excuse me, and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So Paul lists a variety of qualifications. First of all, above reproach, meaning a blameless character. There is nothing that is charged against him openly. So you, 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 you talk about a man who's going to be an elder and the first thing that comes out, wait a minute, isn't this guy the one who was uh, accused of fraud and had to go to court and you know, he, he defrauded the government? You see, you don't want that kind of reaction <laughs> when you put a name up for, for elder. Above reproach, no one has something to, that's not perfect, that's just above reproach. Next one, this is the complicated one, husband of one wife, oh my goodness or as it is put in the Greek, one wife's husband. Lots of discussion about what exactly this means, a lot of points of view. Uh, this is the only reference, by the way, in the entire passage, this is the only reference to sexual conduct in these qualifications. So Paul is saying two things about this man in this area. First of all, he's saying that this person is a, is a one woman man. He's not sexually promiscuous, as were many in the Gentile converts, among the Gentile converts from paganism. You could have a person who is married, only married one time, but avail himself of temple prostitutes or seek sexual activity outside of his marriage. So you know, legally would qualify, well, I'm only married to one woman, but promiscuous. And so this idea here eliminates the idea of any man who is promiscuous, even though married to just one woman, uh, it eliminates that person from uh, consideration. Um, secondly, he's barring polygamists from the eldership. You know, there was a, this, there was a practice, or rather this was a practice um, uh, in that time. There was cultural polygamy, in those days, 
and some of it overlapped in the early church before it died away. And Paul was holding the leaders to the ideal monogamous form of marriage. Now, my approach here, um, and there are different points of view. Like the one point of view uh, 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 of the meaning of this is, it's a man who's been married only one time and his wife is still alive. That's one point of view. Another point of view is, it's a, uh, it's a man who has been um, uh, married and only if he has lost his wife through death, in other words, he became a widower, and then remarried, in that case, he can serve as an elder. Uh, if a man is married to a woman, um, a second wife, you know, divorce, uh, he, he is not allowed to serve. So there's a lot of different you know, perspectives here. Uh, my argument about the husband of one wife, you know, one wife's husband, one woman man, my argument here is based on Paul's previous statement that those who aspire to be elders should be above reproach. So this is a reference to character. And so the following verses expand on what type of character traits this person should have. And the first thing that he talks about is the husband of one wife. Therefore, he's referring to a man's character and not simply his legal status. You know, married only once, divorced and remarried, widower, widowed, and remarried, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now I've uh, provided a, a second handout, uh, and it's a, a kind of an exchange, an email exchange I had with someone else, actually one of the elders uh, in another congregation, who is asking me about that question. So I, I give a little more detail in that handout. Again, a lot of different opinions on what this means. Uh, I've just tried to give you some of the points of view uh, that people have on this particular, uh, the meaning of this particular thing. All right, so the next thing he talks about is uh, the man should be temperate, meaning moderate, not an extremist, not an extremist. Prudent, meaning careful in words, careful in actions. Respectable, meaning a person who is dignified, a someone who is orderly. You know, if you're referring to one of your elders and you're saying, oh, he's a mess, uh, not a good thing. <laughs> you, don't want, you don't want one of your elders to be described as, oh, he's a mess. No, you don't want him to be a mess. It doesn't mean he has to be an A-type, you know, everything lined up, but you don't want him to be a mess. You don't want his life to be a mess. Okay, that's, that's not who you want for your, for your leader. Um, it says also hospitable. A uh, Greek word there means lovers, lover of strangers. Lover of, not just having folks over, not just having your gang over to your house, a lover of strangers. Why? Because in the church there are often strangers that come in. People who are baptized become members of the church. They're strangers. People who visit, people who have problems, who come to the church for help. They're strangers. We need our leaders to be lovers of strangers, not you know, uh, not, not individuals that don't like strangers. Uh, able to teach, of course, qualified and able to teach, not necessarily able to teach publicly as I am now, able to teach another person, at least one-on-one. -on -one. We have, some of our elders are expert and uh, experienced, well-educated teachers. Others have learned the Bible as you have learned the Bible, being in Bible classes and self-study. But all of the elders are able to teach, whether it be a class or one-on-one, -on -one, they have the skill to do this type of work. Uh, he says, uh, not addicted to wine. Well, there you go, not addicted to wine. Someone, uh, not someone who loves strong drink, not a, a regular drinker. Pugnacious, and not, not to be pugnacious, someone who is not, but he goes into the negative things here. You know, pugnacious means someone who has a quick temper, a chip on their shoulder, ready to fire up. Well, you don't want to be at a discussing sensitive issues with someone who kind of flares up and blows up you know, at, at, at every negative thing, or if somebody brings a point of view that is opposite to their point of view. That's the kind of person that you're wanting uh, in your leadership. Uh, gentle and uncontentious. Uh, a wonderful uh, translation I saw of this word is the English word yielding. Yielding, you know the yield sign, that triangular sign, you see yield, you got to slow down. 
You want a person that's able to slow down. You know, things are moving at a fast pace, problems happen, there's a fire raging, I, I mean, you know, metaphorically, there's a fire raging in the church of controversy or something like that. You want somebody that's able to slow things down and okay, let's take things one at a time, let's discuss, that's the kind of person you want. Not a person who's argumentative, but someone who, whose goal is to find peace and not simply win the argument. Again, eldership is a group project. These men work together as a group. And so you notice that a lot of these qualifications um, enable a, an individual to work with other people. Uh, it says also free from the love of money, someone who is not greedy, someone who is not materialistic, like it's all about money, it's all about stuff. You know? Why? Well, because in the church we deal with money. And, and, and in larger, you know, our budget's what? About a half a million dollars a year? That's a lot of money to be responsible for. So you have to have someone who has a pretty good attitude about money. Uh, manages their own household well. Um, someone who knows how to meet the needs of his family, emotionally, physically, spiritually. You know, the, 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 the head of the family is not the, quote, boss of the family. The head of the family is the servant of the family. Understanding and knowing what the emotional and spiritual and physical needs are of his family and being able to provide for those. Well, it's the same kind of man that you want to be leading in the church. Not a new convert, just speaks for itself, right? A person of experience in the church. And, and I add also, a person of experience in the struggle with sin. Because every Christian's life, a big component of it is the struggle with sin. So our elders also need to understand what that's about, the struggle with sin. Why? Because they're fellow strugglers. That's what, is that, that's what enables them to be compassionate and empathetic with individuals in the church who are struggling with sin and many times fail. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's just the truth of what takes place in the church. And of course, a good reputation, well thought of by all and worthy to represent the church. So, so the, here's some of the qualifications that Paul mentions in Timothy. So let's go to Titus here, the other one. We don't have that much time and I'd like to cover Titus as well this morning. In Titus chapter one, if you have your Bibles, verses five to nine, Paul repeats some of the same ideas using different words and he adds a few other qualifications. For example, in verse five it says, for this reason I left you in Crete that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed, notice that Titus appoints. That Greek word appoints is not, okay, it's not, okay, you're going to serve and you're going to serve, not you, not you, you're going to serve. That's not what that word means. The word means to raise up, to raise up. And it implies not only a, you know, selecting, but also training and equipping. So part of the task of the evangelist, and we'll study that when we get to that part, the preacher, the evangelist, is to point out, equip, raise up men who will serve as elders. So let's see now verses six to nine. He says, uh, come on, help me, there we go. He says, namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion, for the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. So he says, above reproach, let's just put him in a list here. Above reproach, same as Timothy, husband of one wife, same as Timothy. Then he says, children who believe and are not accused of dissipation and rebellion. This all refers to that man's children. 
Uh, do not select a man whose children are non-believers or who are living pagan lives or rebelling against their fathers. So this explains further the passage about ruling well over one's own household. While the children are with you and you have responsibility, if they live like pagans and rebel against you in your own home, well, you may not be a good candidate for the eldership. You probably have to spend a little more time working on your own home before you start working on leading others in the church. He does mention also um, above reproach as God's steward, faithful in the things of the church. Hang on, let me just change that, there we go. Uh, then he says, uh, someone who is not self-willed. We know what that means. You know, my way or the highway, that's self-willed. You know, my way or the highway. Quick-tempered, addicted to wine, pugnacious, fond of sordid gain and all. All of these, the same as Timothy. Hospitable, again, the same as Timothy. Uh, in the next group, loving what is good, loving righteousness, looking for and wanting the right thing for people, for the church. Sensible, meaning temperate and prudent, just, someone who is fair. Because there are disputes in the church many times between people and, and, and these disputes go to the elders and we ask them to kind of help us kind of you know, sort things out. You're wanting them to be fair. You know, you, you, it's easier to take a decision that may not you know, achieve what you wanted if you trust that the, that the leaders who made that decision are fair. You know, the, the thing about God's judgment at the end is that we know it will be fair. So we, we want that same idea when we are looking at our leaders. Devout, I think this is so important, devout. Men who are devoted. Men, I'll give you another word that we don't use very often. Men who are pious. You know what piety means? Piety means someone who gives importance to spiritual things. Spiritual things are of high importance to this person. Self-controlled goes without saying, right? Self-controlled, not swayed. Holding fast the word. In other words, faithful in maintaining the Bible as God's word and able to use it to build and to defend the church. You know, a lot of qualifications there. And usually when we kind of run through these, it usually discourages present elders. You know, they're listening to this and saying, my goodness, oh wow, I, I don't know if I got all of that. You know? <laughs> and sometimes it makes others feel completely unworthy of even trying to lead God's people. And of course, that's just a human reaction. If you, have, if you have a shred of humility in your soul, of course that's how you're going to react when they, when they list all those things. Wow. You, know, you, you, want, you want to feel guilty? How about listing all the things that good parents ought to be? <laughs> right? And all of us will say, oh my goodness. You know, I've always said parenting is the most guilt producing activity around. So it works the same way, you know, because eldering is a lot like parenting in many respects. So when you list all the qualifications given by God, no less, of course it, it, it makes one feel mm, unworthy. So in closing the lesson, I want to give you a couple of uh, comments and observations about these qualifications, okay, to kind of put them in context. First of all, remember that these are eternal, meaning that in every generation, God wants people like this. So these qualifications are eternal, but they're not impossible. See what I'm saying? They're eternal, but they're not impossible. These are all human qualities that people possess to a greater or to a lesser degree. And so the church needs men who see these things in themselves and are willing to serve. So remember that, eternal but not impossible. Secondly, these qualifications are mostly subjective in nature. Except for being a man, well that's not subjective. 
and being married with believing children, you know, that's something, you know, you're married or you're not, you know what I'm saying? Those are kind of objective things. All the other qualifications are not absolutes. I mean, let me ask you, just how hospitable or how devout or how sensible or how temperate do you have to be to be an elder? Who gets to measure that? Is there a measuring stick? You know, how hospitable do you have to be? Do you have to have people over your house seven days a week? How about five days? How about once a week? How about once every two weeks? Where's the, how do you judge? So God knows that we can't be these things to a perfect degree. Only Jesus could do that. But elders should be qualified to a positive degree. Let me explain what I mean by that. In other words, these qualifications should be present in that man to the degree that they can be at least recognized by others. See what I'm saying? So how fair do you need to be to qualify as an elder? Well, you need to be as fair as it takes for others to notice that in you. So let's take the hospitable thing again, okay? How hospitable do you need to be to serve as an elder, to qualify? I would say you have to be hospitable to the point where other people are saying, oh yeah, oh yeah, you know, Harold or Johnny or whatever, oh, I've been in their house a lot of times. You, know? you mention the word, you mention the qualifications, and people know that, yeah, you are like this. Yes, you are a, fir, a, a fair person. Yes, you're an individual that doesn't kind of you know, blow up or get angry right away. In other words, you have that qualification to the degree that it shows and other people recognize. That's why we hand out the forums you know, when we're talking about elders and some men have been put forward and we hand out these things and all these qualifications are there and we ask you, check off this, this and that to the degree that you know. Not everybody has all the qualifications, but when we get all the things back, you know, we look at them and we see, well look, brother so-and-so, this person checked off four or five, another person checked off other qualifications that they recognize in that person, and that's how you kind of work your way to a decision. We may not feel good enough or just enough but if others in the church see these things in us, it means that they do exist to the degree that enable us to serve others as elders. That's why God has organized it in such a way that others select us and not we ourselves. And then one other thing, these qualifications provide a framework for growth. You know, there are many adjectives that describe how the Christian needs to be and become that are not mentioned on the list. Notice zealous, it's not mentioned on the list that you should be zealous. How about kind? Not mentioned there anywhere, kind. Or hopeful, hopeful. Do you think it'd be important for our leaders to be hopeful? It's not mentioned. These specific things are mentioned because the nature of the specific task of the elders requires that they possess and cultivate specific qualities if they're to succeed in the work of the elder and avoid certain accusations that are especially easy for them to be subject to. So elders need a kind of a blueprint for their own personal growth and the Lord provides it here in Timothy and in Titus. You know, you don't select an elder and, he, and, and install that man in that office and all of a sudden he's a full-blown elder. Usually we, we take a man who is showing these qualifications, who has the potential, and it takes several years in the eldership itself as he is mentored and encouraged by other elders to grow into that role, to really begin to you know, come online, as we say, and begin to be effective in the service of eldership. Okay, so that's, that's a lot of material just in one lesson about elders. Next week we're going to talk about the work of the elder, selecting the elder, 
And we'll also have a brief profile of the elder's wife, also a very important part of the equation. Okay, that's our lesson for today. Thank you very much for your attention.